You ever one of those lessons in math that's sort of like, who cares? And it's just a bunch of uh, theoretical things that you probably won't use in the actual class, but you might use if they actually let you do science with your math. It makes people hate math, basically. This is one of those lessons. Anyway, um, polynomial equation root theorems, it pops up sometimes. Uh, the whole purpose of uh, the theorem, the three theorems that I'm going to talk about is if you have some sort of polynomial function and you need to address it in a way that I need to know what the roots are, at least it gives you somewhere to start. It's kind of like a thinning the herd scenario as opposed to you can find the exact number using these theorems, but it's better than nothing if you've got nothing to work with. And the first one is the rational root theorem. And what it says essentially is if I'm looking for rational uh, roots to things or I want to know uh, what root so basically if I drew this drew an equation and I needed the roots which is where they cross the uh, x-axis or um, essentially when I set the whole thing equal to zero if I factor them out what if I equal to zero each one of the factors what numbers do I get I can't really figure it out with the rational root theorem but I can get an idea of sort of where to go with it and what you find is if you have uh, the first term generally in your uh, polynomial and your last term, you can find pretty much all you need to know. If you have an integer root, so it's 2 or 6 or negative 1 or whatever, it has to be a factor of the last term. It's just the nature of it because you're eventually going to multiply some constant term by some other constant term and you end up getting uh, your integer term. If you have a rational root, so uh, something that's a fraction essentially, what it's going to be is a combination of the factor of the last term divided by the factor of the first term. Now, of course, that can give you integer roots too. They're just saying, well, by themselves they are. Well, one of the uh, factors of the first term has to be one, right? It has to be something in one. Well, that's why this is true. So let's look at one uh, just to get an idea of what to do with it. It's really, it's helpful if you're in the field, but it's not super helpful uh, just using it on its own. It's kind of outside of its context. But anyway, I'm going to try to roll get the little um, shadow totally out of the way. What are the rational roots of 2x to the third minus x squared plus 2x plus 5? To figure this out, we only need to look at the first and last numbers. And then we're going to do a lot of annoying sort of fill-in-the-blank style uh, moves from there. So let's look at the this term, this 5, and then I'm going to look at the 2 as well. Um, the 5 will give me the factors of 5 are, of course, just 1 and 5. And the factors of 2 would just be one and two. Now I'm going to do some bit of combination about what possible factors I have. Well, the po the possible factors would be one divided by one, so one, and it could be plus or minus. Uh, I could have five divided by one, plus or minus. I could have um, five divided by two that's plus or minus, and then I could have 1 divided by 2, and that's plus or minus. Those are all of my options, so this should really be just a positive 5 there. Those are really all of my options that I have for roots. Now, you know, from there, well, what do you do about it? Well, what you do is you start a you try to plug them in to see what actually works. So it's easier if you make a little bit of a chart for yourself, like you just have um, negative 5 over 2, and then you have you might want to put the plus right next to it. If you want to do it in, you know, full on numeric, you could do negative one right here and negative five right here, and then you'll do negative one half, and then on your way up you'll get one half, one, five over two, and then five. And all I'm gonna do is plug these numbers in for x to see if they give me zero. So I'll do negative 5 first. And remember, number one, don't do that. Um, when you type in the, uh, the next set, so it does minus x squared, because this is a negative 5 that I'm plugging in, make sure you put it in parentheses. Otherwise, it'll give you some weird answer sometimes. So I do all that, and I hit enter, and I get um, a syntax error, of course, because, you know, why wouldn't I? I'm trying to figure out where the syntax error is. Oh, they're telling me it's right there. Okay. So I'll try one more time. Uh, 
In the old days, I would have totally deleted this now that I made that mistake. But in this one, I'm just going to stick with it because, you know, sometimes you'll get that sort of syntax error. And a lot of the times, it's just because of something that you typed in that didn't mean anything. So you hit it, and it gives you negative 280. In order for it to be a root, obviously, it has to equal 0. So that's not going to work. So, you know, that's not a root. So underneath, you'll put what their overall values are, negative 280. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you the rest of them because I'm not going to remotely consider making you sit there through that much stuff. So after you plug them all in, the only thing you'll find that gives you zero is this one. So really, all I can really say that they, in terms of what a rational root would be, is that x, or sorry, yeah, x is equal to negative one, or y is equal to negative one. I'm sorry. So that's your only rational root because when I tried out all the possibilities. Um, all I could get was this. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean there aren't irrational ones, like where you have a square root, or there aren't any imaginaries. It just means for rational roots, negative 1 is the only one. So take your factors of 5 over your factors of 2, work out all the possibilities, plug it in and see if it works, and it can give you the, the correct answer that you're looking for. It's not very fun, obviously, but it's one way. That's one of the ways that you would use the rational root theorem. You can also use it, incidentally, enough to... Um, find out what the rational roots are. And all you do then is find one that's a root and then use synthetic division uh, most of the time at that point to come up with the rest of your roots. So if one of them works, it's kind of nice because it makes it easier uh, to figure out what your other uh, roots are that are rational. Find one is kind of the key to the rest. So there's that. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the conjugate root theorem. Another a crazy time math concept uh, that exists that makes everything seem more complicated than it really is. What it, it says if it has rational coefficients. Basically, if it has uh, non-square root uh, terms that are in front of your x, x squared, and whatnot. So anything you have with x to the third and x squared and all that, as long as it's not, it could be a fraction, as long as it's not some irrational term where you have a square root in front of it. Knowing that to be the case, you should know that in order to get rid of it and uh, cancel it all out, you're going to have to have uh, sort of the balance of positive and negative in there. So you're going to have both of them. So what it's saying is, if you have rational numbers in front of your x squared, when you have something plus the square root of something, you better have something minus the square root of something as well. So uh, if I had 3 plus the square root of 2, well, in order to cancel out this whole thing, I need to be able to eventually get rid of the square root. So I'm going to have this as a root also. So that kind of setup. That's what they're saying. On the other side of it, if it has real coefficients, so anything other than imaginary numbers in front of the x, so 4x, I mean, you could even have square roots, I guess. But as long as it's a real coefficient and not an imaginary number, uh, if you have what are called complex roots, so something with an imaginary number, you have to have the plus and the minus version. So if I have a plus bi and then a minus bi has to be there also. So if I don't have anything in front of the x to the third that's imaginary, well, you have to be canceling it out with something. And the way to do it is to make sure that if I have 4 plus 2i, I also have 4 minus 2i. Both of those will tend to you know, cancel each other out as roots in order to give me only real numbers in front of my coefficients, even if they aren't particularly pretty ones. So let's look at one of those, or two situations where you would use it anyway. If a polynomial has rational coefficients, so meets our criteria, and has roots of square root of 2 and 1 plus i, what are the other roots? So they're basically saying, OK, in this situation, I've got this square root of 2 thing, and I've got 1 plus i. Well, the thing we just read said that if that was the case, and I had rational coefficients, if I have a square root of 2, which is really 0 plus square root of 2, I need to have the negative version of it as well. So 0 minus square root of 2 also needs to exist. Similarly, where I had 1 plus i, I also need to have 1 minus i. So I don't really need the 0 here. So I'm going to say my roots are this 
and this, a square, negative square root of 2 and 1 minus i. That's all it says. I mean, it's not really that complicated. It's just a lot of words that just say stuff that seems complicated when it really isn't. Um, what third degree polynomial with rational coefficients uh, with rational coefficients has roots negative 4 and 2i? Now, I said before that if you had rational coefficients, so basically I've got numbers that are real in front of the uh, coefficients and they're not square roots, incidentally enough, if they're, they're rational. But if it's rational, it's real. It's just one of those things. Uh, what are the roots? And it has roots negative 4 and 2i. Well, it tells me it's a third degree polynomial, which means it has three roots to it generally. So I can say, and it must have something to balance out that minus 2i. This is 0 plus 2i. So the other one would be minus 2i. So that makes my roots negative 4, 2i, and negative 2i. Now to figure out what the polynomial is, all I need to do is convert these into a factorable form and then just do the, you know, a little bit of multiplying. It's not that hard. So I'm going to change the x minus 4 into x plus 4. I'm going to change the, uh, both of these, you can put them in, you can say you're changing them or whatever, you're just balancing them. So really I'm setting them up to uh, be able to do a little bit of uh, cancelization. That's kind of the whole point of it. The reason that you want to do this, by the way, becomes apparent in just a second. I'm going to do this set first and I'll come back for this one. So I'm going to lay this over here. x squared minus 2 i times x minus or plus 2 times i times x and then you get uh, negative 2i times positive 2i which is minus 4i squared. Now if you remember i squared is really negative 1 so what this really says is x squared and these all cancel out. That's why you wanted it. That's why you wanted the opposite to cancel out that imaginary number because if the coefficients are real numbers, you can't have imaginary numbers in there. So uh, this becomes negative 4 times negative 1 and you get x squared plus 4. And then I'll just bring down the x plus 4 here. I want to do a little bit more. I don't want to. I just have to to get the problem done. Plus 4x plus 4x squared plus 16. So my final answer, once I work it all out, is x to the third plus 4x squared plus 4x plus 16. So it give, this one's a little bit more helpful, I guess. All you have to really remember uh, to get the right answer, oh, equals zero. All you have to do to remember uh, in terms of this is in order to get rational coefficients or numbers in front that aren't square roots I need to have a negative and a positive so they'll cancel out I'll get rid of it and if you do square root time like square root of 2 times square root of 2 it gives you you know just 2 so there's no in sort of it's canceling out things or it will give you a negative 2 anyway so it cancels out. You want to do that. If you have imaginary numbers, you want to have a negative and a positive, so you cancel out that middle term again. That's the whole point of it. And then you'll have uh, i times i, which is i squared, which is negative 1. So that's the point of the uh, uh, conjugate root theorem. The last one is Descartes' rule of signs, which is kind of helpful sometimes. If I want to know how many positive real roots I have, so roots that are plus 6, plus 5, whatever it happens to be. I can't tell you what numbers they are based on this theorem. I can just tell how, how many they are. Like I said, it was just a narrowing down situation. All I have to do is look how many sign changes. If I do just whatever it already is, I look at the sign changes. The number of sign changes is less or even than that number. So if it changes four times, uh, I go down. There could be four or two roots available to me and just based on that number of sign changes. If there's three sign changes in the original equation. There's either, uh, you know, or sorry, there's two sign changes, say it's two or zero, that kind of thing. There could be no, po there could be no roots that exist, um, or positive real roots. If I want to know how many negative roots exist, um, I'm dealing with the number of sign changes when I do p sub negative x. So I need to change the, the x's in the equation to negative go ahead and work it out to see what signs I end up with and that'll tell me how many negative real roots they are. Once again, it doesn't tell me specifically what the numbers are, it just gives me some overall view. So let's look at a problem where I used Cart's rule. I want to know how many positive real roots I have and how many negative real roots. So for the positive real roots it's easy. It's uh, positive to negative and then negative to positive. So that would be uh, 1, 
two sign changes. So I can say the number of positive real roots is either two or zero. It's possible that every root is negative, but I don't know yet. In the negative real roots, I do need to do a little bit of uh, math ahead of time. So what I'm doing now is looking at what it would be if I change these x's to negative x. So in this case, um, I'm doing this is uh, negative x to the third power, which means it becomes negative, which means this whole thing becomes negative, negative 9x to the third power. The only thing I'm looking at is this. I don't apply the 3 over here or anything weird like that. Um, negative x squared here would be plus, but it's already uh, negative, so I just keep it at negative 4 x squared, and then I bring down plus 10 because the negative x won't change anything there. So I just do another sign count. There's no sign change. It's negative to negative. Sign change here, there is 1. So the number of negative real roots is that there's 1. Um, other than that, I don't really get much information from the Cartes rule. It's helpful in the sense that if I was starting out from nothing, I could get somewhere at least. And, you know, sometimes it's nice to have just something getting you going in the correct direction. Sometimes it's really annoying and it doesn't help you in the slightest. But, you know, that's the Cartes rule. It's not really like this impossible thing that no human can ever do. It just is a lot of math jargon for uh, something that you don't pretend to do very much. But if you need to know how many positive and negative real roots you have, at least you have somewhere to go with it.